everybody. Welcome to our online recording of the service this week. We're so happy to have you with us in this online format. Maybe you're joining us online because you're helping out in the kids this week when we had service, or maybe you're checking it out from somewhere else. You're not local. And either way, we are so happy to have you. If you are local, please come visit us in person. We would love to have you. Our last service of the year is December 23rd for our Christmas Eve celebration. So come join us 6 p.m. on the 23rd. We are continuing our series through the Gospel of Mark, and I feel like I should be an old TV announcer when I say, on the last episode of Life with Jesus, John talked about an episode where Jesus again was turning things upside down as he taught about the Sabbath, and how once again he came into conflict with the teachers of the law as he did this. Now we know, we've repeated this often, that Mark is the smallest gospel, it is the most fast paced, and it's believed by scholars to be the earliest account, the earliest gathered and organized account of Jesus's life and ministry. In Mark's account, we are nearing the end of an important section because chapters one through three actually are a particular section. And then in start, starting in chapter four, we get another section with increased focus on teaching being directed to the insiders. So one through three, we have lots of miracles, lots of teaching to the crowds. And starting in chapter four with some parables, we're going to get some teaching to the insiders. Because even though the crowds are still gathered around, they start, uh, it becomes very clear that they don't understand anything that Jesus is saying. But we're going to end the first section of chapters one through three tonight with the passage, Mark 3, 20 through 35. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul and by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. And then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and mother. So, can I ask you guys something? Are you uh, feeling hungry right now? Are you pretty full? On our corporate service night, we've been having these meals, which have been so great. So for them, they're they're going to come into the service probably probably feeling more like they need a nap than a meal. But if you are still hungry, you're in luck because Mark is serving us a sandwich. Why do I say that? Well, the Gospel of Mark is full of literary structures, literary patterns. Yes, just like you learned about in English class so long ago. And if you've forgotten, if it's been a while, maybe rewind in your mind. Yes, far back, some of uh, for some of us that may bring up memories of strange smells and uh, Axe body spray and acne and all of those things or maybe that's just me. But in the Gospel of Mark, we see a bunch of literary patterns that scholars have identified. And one of those is the sandwich. Okay, it's called the sandwich literary pattern. Or if you want to be boring, it's called ABA. And what they mean by that is Mark will have several instances where one account starts 
and then leaves off. You don't get the resolution to it. And then another account comes in the middle, which would be the B or the meat of the sandwich, and it resolves itself. And then you go back to that first account and it resolves itself. And Mark seems to serve up these sandwiches because he believes the accounts illuminate each other, that they go together in some way to help us understand their meaning, that they taste better together if you could stretch the metaphor that far. So let me show you what I mean in the scripture for today. First, we have the bread, verses 20 and 21. When Jesus enters a house, they're so crowded they cannot eat, and his family shows up to take him away, saying he's out of his mind. So nothing is resolved there. We know that it's crowded and that his family has shown up, which is a sort of conflict, but we don't get the resolution to that conflict yet. Instead, something else happens. And uh, depending on your favorite type of sandwich, you could say this is the PB&J or the tuna fish or the ham and cheese of this particular sandwich, verses 22 through 30, where Jesus has this conflict with the teachers of the law. He talks about the house being divided, about Satan not being able to cast out Satan, lots of things, including the unforgivable sin. We will touch on that later if you're curious. And that whole thing comes to a resolution. Jesus' words are pretty clear when he thinks about their aspersions on his character. But then you get the bread again, verses 31 through 35. We go back to this family conflict as Jesus' mother and siblings try to get him to come outside. They're not on the inside of the house. They're on the outside of the house, which is important. But Jesus labels those who are literally sitting around him. The people who have put in with him, who are following him, who want to hear what he has to say, his real family. So do you see it? Do you see why he might have arranged things the way he did? Mark is emphasizing a theme that this new household of faith is uh, very important. We ask, why didn't Jesus just go out and check on his family? Why didn't he say, hey, it's okay, I'm not crazy. Why don't you come in and listen to what I have to say? Well, because his family, not unlike the teachers of the law in the next episode, are attributing his ministry, his God-given work to a different power. So the motivation doesn't matter whether it's because they care about him or like the teachers of the law, they just want to stop him. The point is they both have the same goal, getting in the way of the kingdom of God. On the other hand, those who sit at his feet, who follow him, who know what they are witnessing is the power of God, they get to freely participate in this new household, in this new family Jesus is building. So given that overall structure, we have a better idea of what's happening in the text. But what about that uh, meaty portion or the PB and J of it all? Well, it starts with Beelzebub. If you go back to verse 22, the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. Well, who is Beelzebub? Bell or Beelzebub as he used to be written in those translations and now it's all changed and it just confuses us more. Well, without going down an academic rabbit hole, we think from studying language that Beelzebul was the name or close to a name for a Philistine god from the Old Testament. And then over time, it became associated, that god became associated with a demonic power that many in Jewish writings and traditions would name. So they saw him as a higher up demon, basically. Notice that the teachers don't say, Jesus is a phony. I knew that guy. He wasn't really possessed. He was just throwing himself on the ground for fun. This guy is a phony. He's a fake. There's actually no ancient sources that say something about Jesus faking miracles. Isn't that interesting? All the earliest sources we have, actually, their explanation is very close to this. It's an echo of this accusation that Jesus cast out demons by demonic power. 
Verse 23, so Jesus called them over to him and he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. Jesus is not taking their nonsense. They may be muttering to themselves over in the corner, but Jesus is going to bring the conflict front and center. How in the world would Satan's power last if he was casting himself out? Why on earth would Satan want to see people freed from his power? And just in case we think this is sort of a low stakes discussion, the Torah was very clear on what happened if you were sort of summoning or using demonic power. It was death. These leaders were accusing him of something that would have called for stoning. But there's something else here we might miss. And I actually have missed this several times as I've read over this passage in the past week and just in my life until I read an article by a scholar named Jeremy Auden. And he points out something very important. Jesus doesn't mention Beelzebul. Isn't that interesting? Who does he mention? Satan. The reason becomes clear in the next verse, verse 27. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. The metaphor might obscure the point a little bit. You may be asking what the heck I'm trying to point you to, but it gives us some clear imagery. The teachers may be worried about this prince of demons, this high up Beelzebul that they've taken from pagan religion and from tradition. But Jesus is the one who has entered into the heart of darkness and tied up Satan, the enemy of God. Forget about lesser powers. Jesus is going straight to the point. How will Satan's house fall? Jesus says, you know, if they were divided, Satan would fall. But Satan will fall because Mark points us towards the end of the story. When Jesus is exalted, not in the way his followers expect, but by being lifted up on a cross. When Satan is bound up because the rule and reign of the thorn-crowned king has begun. That's pretty crazy. Verse 28, truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven They are guilty of an eternal sin. If you've ever heard or read these verses out of context, I had a conversation with someone just a couple weeks ago about this so-called unforgivable sin. You need to hear me loud and clear. This is not talking about suicide. That's the number one question that comes up about this. And hopefully you can see that now that you've read this passage with us in context. What a painful lie from the pit of hell. This is not talking about suicide. Jesus is calling the teachers out for attributing the mighty acts of the Holy Spirit to the prince of demons. They are witnessing the fulfillment of God's miraculous redemptive plan, and they are saying it's straight from the devil. So the kingdom of God has the work of releasing captives. And instead of rejoicing with these people who have been released from captivity to darkness, they are pointing the finger and saying, that's not of God. That is from the devil. So in case you're wondering, that's the context of the unforgivable sin. But what about us? I think in our Western world of uh, tiny nuclear families and maybe even the, the pithy idea of a chosen family, we can miss the gravity of Jesus's words there at the end. Family was everything back then in that world. From economic stability, you always went into the family business to honor in society where you were at, where your family was at, was determined by your actions, maybe a reason they came to stop Jesus, to familial love and loyalty, which we are more familiar with. 
We know Jesus didn't shun his family. That's not what this passage is about. Mary would be following after him at different points in the Gospels. His brothers would later come to faith, at least two of them would, and we know from tradition that they wrote some of the epistles in our Bible. But he would not abandon his mission for the sake of their comfort. They could come follow him. They stood on the outside. They could have come inside. They could have pushed their way through. They could have sat at his feet and kept their mouths shut for a little bit, tried to listen to what he was saying. Jesus was going to let people follow him. He was not going to change his message to follow after them. And he lays this teaching before his disciples, us today as well as them, the past and present, because we're all faced with that choice. Is our ultimate loyalty to Jesus, is our ultimate loyalty to do what Jesus wants us to do, to follow after him? Or is it to the expectations around us? Is it to bad familial patterns of communication? Is it to loyalty to political structures or power structures that are at play in our lives, in our country? Is it unhealthy ideas of identity? Is it uh, society viewing us as an okay person that we're on the inside and not the outside? Is it resentment or fear or pride or hurt? If any of those things are the driving motivation, whenever we try to stop Jesus, like his family did, like these teachers did, we are on dangerous ground. No, Jesus, no helping the poor for me. Sorry. No, Jesus, no praying for others. I'm kind of uncomfortable in this moment. I don't don't really want to do that. No, Jesus, not that wrong. I can't I can't forgive that. I, I just can't go there. No, Jesus, no, no examining how this deep-seated anger is controlling my life and spilling out on my family and friends. No, Jesus, no sacrifice, no love, no confession, no discomfort, no humility. Are we trying to stop Jesus or are we trying to serve him? Are we trying to stop Jesus or are we trying to serve him? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Go back to that parable. Who's bound up? Satan. And we're running around acting like he still has control of our house. If Satan is bound up, then we are free. We're free to follow Jesus. When I was looking at this passage, I kept thinking, why is it that Christian, as Christians, we so often let our house be divided instead of dividing up Satan's? He's all bound up. We could do that. We could take territory. He has no power over the power of the cross of Christ, over our salvation, over becoming more like him and obeying him. But we act like it. We act like we're working for Satan sometimes (laughs) instead of working for Christ. Of course, no sooner did that thought come into my head that then I was struck by a situation in my own life. I actually, uh, this situation kept coming to mind that I thought I had forgotten about and I had to address it because I knew I couldn't preach about this without actually <laughs> addressing it. So a couple of years ago, without going into enormous detail, I was at a funeral And the funeral was officiated by um, my old youth pastor. I had had my senior year. And in the course of conversation with him, he ended up saying a few things that were really hurtful to me. And they hurt especially because he had been a person of influence in my life at that sort of formative time. And he was somebody I looked to for affirmation, but I didn't really get that out of the conversation. So I pushed it aside. You know, I thought I was over it. I chalked it up to, you know, this is kind of typical experience for a female pastor sometimes, or or this is just uh, 
fumbling for words, you know, whatever it was, I kind of pushed it aside and let it fester, unfortunately. And I didn't realize how those words had affected me until it came up in conversation with somebody else. And they mentioned they had heard from him how much he was worried about that conversation, that he really felt like he hadn't handled it well and really hoped I hadn't been hurt by it. Well, of course I had. I had been hurt by it. But that conversation went by the wayside. I left it. I didn't do anything about it. I just kind of continued to let it fester. I didn't want to rehash the whole thing. And then it came up again and again. And yes, over the course of two years, I never sent a message or said anything, even though I knew that he was feeling bad about this. And I realized as soon as I wrote this sermon, that I was acting out of unforgiveness. I could have reached out and put his mind at ease. It didn't matter if we saw eye to eye on everything. I could have just done that, could have done that. But I didn't, I didn't express my feelings, maybe because it was uncomfortable, or maybe because I was thinking he'd make the first move, or maybe, just maybe, because I wanted to hold on to that little piece of hurt. You know, sometimes we like to do that for some reason. Long ago in a seminary class discussing the book of James, there was something said that stuck with me for a long time. And that's about trial and temptation. And this has been sort of a guide for me for many, many years. In every difficult situation, we as Christians have a choice whether that situation is going to be to us a temptation something that causes us to sin, to stumble, to hurt others, to cause more brokenness, or if that situation can be a trial. Difficult, but something that refines us and that we can make choices in to be like Jesus. I sent that message this week, just in case you were wondering. It was really hard. And almost immediately within an hour, got a very heartfelt message back and we're going to meet up sometime. I I should have done that two years ago. I should have done that two years ago. And by reading this passage, I was convicted deeply that I was trying to stop Jesus. I was holding on to words that I knew someone else was regretting and turning over and over in their mind. And guess what, guys? Sometimes rebuking Satan does look like a charismatic standing up and shouting. I love a good get behind me Satan as much as the next person. But sometimes, maybe most of the time, rebuking Satan looks like those small, faithful actions that follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It looks like carrying your cross on a daily basis and submitting to him and what he would have you do in difficult and painful situations. It looks like sitting at Jesus's feet when people are on the outside saying, that's crazy. She, he's out of their mind. It looks like following Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just, ask that if there is any situation that you're bringing to mind in people's hearts in this moment, that you would help them to have the power of the Holy Spirit to act on whatever you ask them to do. Lord, that you would make us a community of people filled with your grace and love and uh, a people of peace. God, we pray that in difficult situations, we would know that you are with us, you love us, and no matter who rejects us, you call us family. Please help us to walk in your footsteps day by day. In Jesus' name, amen.